Back to politics now. Uh, more Republicans have come out criticizing President Trump, responding to the deadly events in Charlottesville in a lengthy Facebook post. Nebraska Senator Ben Sass said, it feels like violence is coming. He wrote in part, what will happen next? I doubt that Donald Trump will be able to calm and comfort the nation in that moment. And the number two Senate Republican, John Cornyn, told the Houston Chronicle, quote, I think the president had an opportunity to send a message that would unite America behind our common resolve to heal those wounds and unite our country. And unfortunately, I don't think he did that. And in the wake of last week's events, the Associated Press had reporters from across nine states speak with Republican officials, some of whom are beginning to openly express private doubts and anxiety about the president's recent actions. In Kentucky, Republican State Senator Whitney Westerfield called Trump's comments after Charlottesville's protests more than a gaffe. I'm concerned he seems to firmly believe what he's saying about it. Tom Davis, a Republican state senator representing coastal South Carolina, said to his discredit, he's been maddeningly inconsistent in advancing those policies, which is part of the reason so little has been accomplished. And Chip Lake, a Georgia-based Republican operative who didn't vote for Trump in the general election, said it's impossible to see a scenario under which this is sustainable under a four-year period. Let's bring in three of the AP correspondents who contributed to that report. On Capitol Hill, Washington Bureau Chief for the AP, Julie Pace, in Madison, Wisconsin, AP State House Correspondent Scott Bauer, in Atlanta, AP National Political Reporter Bill Barrow, also here on the set for the conversation. We have columnist for the New York Times, Brett Stevens. Julie, let me begin with you. Um, anything new here? Or are these a lot of the same Republicans that said Donald Trump would never run, Donald Trump would never win the primary, Donald Trump would never win the general election? Well, we tried to talk to Republicans who really uh, were across the spectrum on Trump during the election. Some folks like Chip Lake, who you saw there, who didn't vote for Trump in the general election. Others like Tom Davis, who was a Trump delegate at the convention. And, and folks who, after the election, decided that they were going to rally around Trump and support him as a president. And we focused on people who were willing to talk about Trump on the record, because there's been a lot of private discussions about the president in Washington and around the country among Republicans uh, in terms of what they say about his competence, uh, about his ability to be a successful president, but we really wanted to focus on what people were willing to say publicly. And, and I think, you know, we have to remember, this is not normal for Republicans, for, for a, a party to be saying these types of things about a sitting president from their own party. It, yeah. it is just not something that happens in politics. It's very abnormal, and I know a lot of people are saying, well, not many have stepped out, but the, the number that have uh, seems fairly unprecedented seven months in. You even have some people talking about a primary three and a half years from now. Let's uh, let's go to Scott Bauer. Scott, a lot of people looking at Wisconsin, obviously a very important state for the president. They will tell you that's at the top of his list uh, if he has any chance of being reelected. Um, his numbers obviously have fallen there, but he wasn't the most popular guy in Wisconsin, even on Election Day. That's right. Uh, he won Wisconsin by less than one percentage point. And what I found in my reporting last week is that there's a real divide between the grassroots who voted for Trump in the state and the Republicans who uh, work behind the scenes, Republican strategists and consultants and the like. Uh, the grassroots seem to still be firmly behind him. And the other folks uh, are saying, I had one person tell me last week that it was the worst week of the American presidency he could remember in his lifetime. So there's a real divide um, here in Wisconsin. Bill, it's Katty Kay here. You write about Chip Lake, um, who's a Georgia-based GOP operative, and he says he told you that he finds it impossible to see this being sustainable over a four-year period. Did he come up with uh, some kind of scenario in which this doesn't last a four-year period that you think is plausible? Well, Chip and several others mentioned that uh, as the pressure build, builds, you might you might think there would be some tipping point, some breaking point uh, for the for the presidency. Uh, but Chip also added, and this reflected other conversations I had, that you know I, I'm done making predictions with this president. It's just every time you think it is going to reach an absolute breaking point, he comes back or simply is able to sustain himself, not not in a way that yields to effective governance, but in a way that still. Uh, doesn't necessarily threaten his his overall standing, uh, so that that's sort of the even from the Republicans coming out. I, I picked up this sense of 
well, I still don't know where this goes. Mm -hmm. Now. And what does this mean, not just for the party, but for the country? Several people did mention, though, that they think if there is a breaking point, it will not come until, unless and until the special counsel yields some sort of, you know, the proverbial smoking gun. Yeah, you and know, the I, I Republicans it, on the on the Hill are, are probably going to wait right. until that point. Brad, I thought it was very interesting this weekend. A lot of people trying to talk about impeachment. A lot of Republicans saying, "Just resign, Mr. President." A lot of suggesting that somehow this tipping point is any different than. I don't know the Access Hollywood tipping right. point or the thousand other tipping points behind before that. Calling it, a former Miss Universe fat, uh, insulting a gold star mother, uh, using race, uh, pretending he didn't know who David Duke was, uh, pretending he didn't know what the Klan did the day before Super Tuesday, saying he was going to ban over a billion Muslims because of the God they worshipped. What tipping point? And we've had we've yeah. had those tipping points. What's different now? Yeah, and what the the thing is, the president has a unique ability to change the subject in American politics. Tonight he's going to talk about um, Afghanistan. He can just he can just move on. He right. has that, presidents in general have that uh, ability. His Achilles heel is that this is a guy who can't apologize. So to the extent that he's pressed on the issue, as you saw on Tuesday in his press conference, he's going to go forward with it and right. dig a deeper hole for himself. But if he has enough discipline, which is the biggest if in American politics, he can just move on. So, you know, it used to be that people would say personnel is policy. Uh, as somebody Not who, with this guy. I was going to say, as somebody who has been uh, harshly critical of uh, Donald Trump from the very beginning, does it provide you any comfort that um, you know, you, Flynn is out and Bannon is out, and now you have McMaster. And do you see any? Do you see well, any silver lining in this very, very dark cloud hanging over the White House? It provides me comfort in the same way that I think it must have provided my father comfort in 1973, 1974, that you had Alexander Haig, Elliot Richardson, Henry Kissinger in the right. White House. A sense that a president, a, a, not just a presidency, but a president, was in decline, and there were serious people at the helm. The real issue, though of course, is that personnel is not policy with Trump because he still retains the whip hand in right. the administration. And the, the, the tenor of the administration spurts out of his mouth. I mean, that's, that's the problem. It isn't as if he's uh, abiding by carefully crafted statements. He just, right. he just rolls with it. Julie, it's Jeremy. I had this really interesting conversation I think you might appreciate given your reporting uh, over the weekend with somebody who is about as diehard a Trump supporter as you can get. And she said to me, well, you know, if, if, if I don't defend him, who else is going to? And I thought that was such a fascinating window into the psyche of, of Trump supporters. It's that somehow this man who's had every advantage in the world, has, has billions of dollars, tremendous success, uh, is, 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 is he has convinced Americans that the system is stacked against him and that they need to rally to his well, side because no one else will. It's still a binary choice, Julie. I mean, they hate the press. They hate the media. The media is being too yeah. tough on him. They hate the Democrats. This is still about Hillary Clinton. This is still about MSNBC. This is still about the New York Times. Yeah. This is still about Bernie Sanders. This is still about everybody but Donald Trump for but a lot why, of Republican supporters. It, why do it they really hate is. Mike Pence? It really is yeah, striking. Exactly. It's it's striking when you when you talk to to folks out in the states and Bill and Scott know this even better than I do from from being in Georgia and Wisconsin. But Trump has really played into a, a feeling among a lot of Americans that that the deck is stacked against them, that the media is corrupt, that Washington is corrupt, and and every time he he raises these issues, people feel a connection to it. And this idea again that he has painted himself as kind of in a corner by himself, that his supporters need to rally around him, given all of the advantages that he has, uh, is, is actually uh, quite a talent for him to be able to do it. But it also gives you a sense of why that support is, is so uh, rock steady among that roughly 30 percent of voters that just will not move no matter what he does or says. Okay, Scott, so uh, we started the program at 6 this morning talking about the new um, NBC Marist poll and the number of Americans in Wisconsin who say that they are embarrassed by the president's conduct. It's 64 percent. Take us back to November just in the week or two after the election. Where would that number have stood then, do you think? How many Wisconsinites, how many more Wisconsinites now are embarrassed by the president perhaps than they were back in November? Or has that number actually not changed very much? 
I think the key thing to remember to look at is, is how Republicans in Wisconsin feel about Donald Trump versus the entire state, how they feel about Donald Trump. His numbers among Republicans have, uh, have improved to the point where he's actually, uh, in, in a poll that was done here in Wisconsin a couple months ago, he's more well-liked among Republicans here than House Speaker Paul Ryan, who's from Wisconsin. That's so interesting. So, um, and, and to Julie's point, you know, I talked to a, a, a Trump supporter in western Wisconsin last week who said, uh, you know, nothing in his mind had changed over the past week, and the people he talked with at the high school football game that Friday night, they uh, they just don't believe anything mm -hmm. they hear from the media, and they That's remain right. completely mm -hmm. committed to Trump, and they feel like, you know, he makes some ill-advised comments, maybe his timing's not so great, but he's the same guy he was in November when they voted for him, and, and they're not really surprised by uh, what they've seen so far. You know, and look, embarrassment is a complex emotion when you're embarrassed for someone you're actually kind of rooting for them you right. feel badly they've stumbled they're on their they're on their back foot but you kind of want them to stand uh up, you you want right. to see them. You want to see them rise. So you know, part of the I think part of what people here, in, you know, New York City don't get is that when Americans hear Donald Trump, they'll say he's inarticulate. He was trying to he was trying yeah. to issue a condemnation. They won't necessarily hear well he was equivocating between neo Nazis, or they'll right. say he didn't quite get the picture. But we're jumping on top of him for failing to right. issue. He's a not a politician. He's not good at this. It'll take some right. time. Right. But, but, yeah. Good at making and excuses. most normal people wouldn't be good at it, by the way, either. You know, it takes a certain yeah. kind of inauthentic polish to be so good at it. I remember his first uh, town hall meeting in New Hampshire, and we came on the next day and said it was incredible. I said he didn't even complete his sentences, but the people in the audience, you could tell they were all completing his sentence for him. Mm. They didn't care that he couldn't complete sentences. They didn't care that he wandered all over the place. It's uh, and Obama uh, supporters don't attack me for saying this, but you know Barack Obama had that wonderful line in one of his 12 biographies that he wrote before he was 29 years old, and it was I was like a mirror, and people uh, you know reflected their own hopes and wishes and dreams off of me. Well, with Donald Trump, it's almost like he's a mirror, and if they resent the media, if they resent liberals in Washington, if they resent uh, mm -hmm. academics, uh, you know, liberal, liberal college campuses, that's all reflected off of Donald Trump. They don't care whether he finishes his sentences or not. No, that's, that's exactly. Yeah, his, his supporters will blame the media, the Russia investigation, and the Republican Party for his failure to get things done, yeah. pretty much in that order. Yeah, well, actually, the top three will be media, media, media. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Hey, he's Julie Pace, Scott Barrow, and Bill Bar Bauer. And Bill Barrow, thank you guys so much. We really do appreciate it. I hope you come back. Let's go now to the New York. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.